Hi. Welcome, everyone. My name is Felina. I'm a professor at Delft University of Technology, where I have been researching spreadsheets for the past seven years. Yeah, I don't know why people laugh at this. This is my job. I don't think it's funny. It's serious business. But actually, this happens a lot. People ask me, you know, how is it possible that you research spreadsheets? Did you actually write a dissertation on spreadsheets? <laughs> yes, I did. Because they matter to many companies. 95% of all US companies still use spreadsheets for financial reporting. So spreadsheets, they sort of run the financial domain, which makes them really interesting. And 50% of spreadsheets form the basis for decisions within companies. So analysts look at spreadsheets and they decide the strategy of their company based on the spreadsheet. So they look at a report and they see, mm, are we selling enough blue cars in France? And if they're not selling enough blue cars, something will happen. They will stop buying blue paint or they start a marketing campaign saying blue is the new black. But based on the data in the spreadsheets, decisions will be made that steer the company. But spreadsheets often exist under the radar. If you go to a random company and you ask them, what, what software system do you use? It might take a day or so, but people will eventually be able to tell you what software there is in the company and who uses what. This is a lot harder for spreadsheets. When I was just in grad school, I worked with an investment bank. They invited me to do some spreadsheet research there. So my first day, I went to the head of the Excel team. I said, hello, can I have a, a list of all your spreadsheets? But there was no such thing. That might have been a little bit a naive question of me. There was no list of all the spreadsheets. He said, yeah, I don't know. You can ask Frank in accounting or maybe Harry over at finance. He's always talking about spreadsheets over lunch. I don't really know. But I think we have a lot of spreadsheets. I think we might have 10,000 spreadsheets. So there I was as a young researcher. I was like, oh, that's a gold mine of research, 10,000 sheets. So I went to the IT department, and in one of their machines with root access in Windows Explorer, I just typed star dot x less star. This was my first spreadsheet scan. Within one second, already 10,000 spreadsheets were found. Within an hour, it was still finding more and more, but already one million XLS files were located. So I went back up to the head of the Excel team and said, no, nah, you might have a little bit more than 10,000 spreadsheets. And eventually, we found two and a half million spreadsheets, and this is a 1,500 employee company. So <laughs> spreadsheets run the world, not, not graphs, unfortunately, yet it's spreadsheets. So this, this must lead to disaster. If spreadsheets are so common in decision making, but no one really knows where they are, things are bound to go wrong, and they do. There's even a European Spreadsheet Risk Interest Group. This is our website, usefreak.org. It has a long list of spreadsheet horror stories. This is their term, not mine. And I could go like beyond lunch listing all of those fun horror stories, but I've selected my favorite three ones. Starting with London, the London Olympics of 2012. I'm sure you all remember that. So you would expect the London Olympics with, I don't know, a gazillion pounds in budget to invest in a very sophisticated ticketing system. They didn't. They used spreadsheets to keep track of ticket sales, and they made a small mistake in one of their spreadsheets, causing one of their swimming stadiums to be overbooked by 10,000 tickets. So, it's not really money loss, but it was embarrassing. People had to come into the ticket exchange, uh, to the ticket office to exchange their tickets. So, you know, it's not what you want. Here's a university that lost $2.4 million because of a typo in a spreadsheet. And here's a Canadian power company that lost $24 million because of a copy paste error in a spreadsheet. So, you know, spreadsheets are bad. Should we not use spreadsheets anymore then? There was this blog post that sort of went viral on the internet a few months ago by a professor called Daniel Lemire, and he said, we should not use spreadsheets anymore. And this was in response to a few climate scientists. They used a spreadsheet for a, uh, oh, sorry, economic scientists. They used a spreadsheet for an economic model, and it turned out to be wrong. And he said, spreadsheets are bad. We shouldn't use them anymore because they are horrible. So first of all, I think it's pretty useless advice. People are using them, so, so we need to do something. This is like, if your house is on fire, he would be next to you saying, oh, you shouldn't have made it out of wood. As yes, I know, but my house is on fire. Can you help? Sure, here's a brick. Uh, it's not helping. I know it's not the right solution, but we should help. But OK, OK, let's, let's entertain this idea for a while. Let's not use spreadsheets anymore. Let's use software, you know, because if you use software, Nothing goes wrong. If you make software, it's always perfect. Nothing happens, ever, ever, ever. It's always perfect. 
So you know, in reality, it's not true. Error rates in spreadsheets are very, very similar to error rates in software. About one in 100 lines of code or one in 100 formulas will have a, an error in them. It's just human brains aren't better than that unless we get machines to program. We will always have similar error rates between spreadsheets and source code. So I think the source of this problem is that spreadsheets are often mislabeled. People think of spreadsheets within their companies as being data. Whereas if you look at it, spreadsheets are actually means of programming. My motto of my research is spreadsheets are code. That's, if you only remember one thing from this talk, this would absolutely be it. Spreadsheets are code and not data. You don't have to believe me right away. It's okay if you don't. I have three reasons why you should actually consider spreadsheets as pieces of programming. First of all, they're used for very similar problems. Here you see an investment calculation. You put in some parameters and a decision comes out. This is a typical programming problem. You could solve this with Java, maybe you make a web app or something on an iPad, or you do it in a spreadsheet. The problem space is really, really similar. And of course you could wonder, why do people do this in a spreadsheet? And I have wondered this as well. When I was working with the investment bank, for example, I asked people, why are you building your entire risk modeling of this bank in a spreadsheet? Shouldn't you use something else? But reality is, we as IT community, we're kind of bad at making software. Often these people have tried, they went to their IT department or their favorite IT supplier, they said, hey, I have the simple calculation, I already prototyped it in a spreadsheet, can you make this into software? And what does IT say? Sure, no problem, that will be six months and one million dollars. <laughs> and I mean, if it even were true, but that's never the case, it will be 12 months and it will be three million dollars and it will never have the features that people want. So, we are just so bad at making software that end users, spreadsheet users, perceive themselves as being better in spreadsheets than, than we are, in programming than we are. So reason one, problem space is really similar. So I go quite a long way to make my point. Such a long way, in fact, that I've implemented a Turing machine in spreadsheet formulas only to prove that spreadsheet formulas are Turing complete. So you cannot say anymore that they are not powerful because here is proof that they are in fact as powerful as any programming language out there. Many people really enjoyed this on the internet. So it was on Hacker News and on Reddit and it was, so, uh, it was so viral that it even brought my website down for a little bit. So people are convinced now it's really programming. The third reason that spreadsheets are really source code is they suffer from typical software engineering problems. So here are a few problems. Only one in three spreadsheets have a manual. An average spreadsheet is used by 12 different people over an average lifespan of five years. So these are typical software engineering problems. These are the problems that we struggled with uh, maybe in the 70s, in the 80s, when we started to realize that software we build on that mainframe a decade ago is, is still being used. So these are typical software engineering problems. So I'm going to assume you are convinced now. Spreadsheets are code because the problem domain is similar, There's just, they are just as complex, and they suffer from typical software engineering problems. So the question then is, and this is the whole basis of my research, is if spreadsheets are code, could we apply methods from software engineering in order to make them better, in order to stop the fire and not build a new house? Because in software engineering, tools have been developed. These problems like understandability of existing source code of which the original programmer maybe isn't available anymore, we sort of know how to do that. Modern RDEs have all sorts of features embedded right in them like a debugger, testing, code metrics, tools that help us not write code, but tools that help us write good, responsible, error-free code. So could we apply those methods on spreadsheets in order to make them better? So the Short conclusion of my entire dissertation is yes, we can. Methods from software engineering are really, really transferable to make spreadsheets better. So the basic idea of what I did in my dissertation is I looked at the concept of code smells. Who's familiar with code smells? Okay, that's super easy. We, everyone that raised their hand, I have a quiz coming up in the next slide. So I'm trusting you will know this. So Fowler's code smells are really transferable to spreadsheets. Here is an example of a code smell. What code smell is this? 
when I did this talk at another conference, someone in the audience yelled, bad naming. <laughs> Which is true, but that's not it. And I was too lazy to fix my slide. Yes, very well, t-shirt for you. It's called the feature envy smell. So this method, you see here that method XY is in class B, but it's using fields from class A, only fields from class A. So you could say in a sense, and this is where the name comes from, that that method is envious of all the nice fields that are in class A, and it would make more sense to put that method in class A because apparently this is where his friends live, this is where the fields are that he relies on. So that method is maybe the design of your code is not optimal because that method is placed in the wrong way. So you could easily see how this would transfer to a spreadsheet. If you have a formula on a certain worksheet that only uses cells from a different worksheet, then that formula might be better suited to place on the first worksheet where all the cells are that it depends on. So, Maybe some of you are wondering, when is Neo4j coming? We're almost there, bear with me. So to analyze these smells, what formulas are in what worksheet, we have to analyze the entire <coughs> worksheet and save the information to a database in order to then query what cells, what formulas do we have in our spreadsheet that might not be located in the optimal worksheet <coughs> given the formulas that they depend on. So this is how our data model looks like. You have a spreadsheet, this is simple I guess. It has worksheets and in a worksheet there can be cells. So this is all pretty straightforward. And then cells can have references. So you can make a formula like uh, equal signs A1 plus A2. So those two cells would be references of a given cell. So a cell has references, but the situation is a little bit more complicated than that. So like this, a cell has references. So A7 plus A9, those would be references. But you know this, you can also refer entire cell groups at once. You can do something like the sum of A1 to A5. So here you have a cell that has a reference, but the reference is a range. The data model gets a bit more complicated because a range then in turn can have cells. So this A1 to A5 are cells referring to the range. So this data model sort of evolved and after a while it was a bit uh, complicated like this. So we have to save information to a database. I didn't think about what database would be most appropriate. I was, I admit it, like most people, I just thought, ha, huh, a database, I will use SQL because this is the only database hammer I know, it's the only thing they told me when I was in university, I'll just save all my spreadsheet information to a SQL database. I didn't even think about it. I, in my mind still then, database equals SQL, so I just use SQL. So that was all okay in the beginning. For instance, the number of worksheets in the spreadsheet, no, that's, that's still simple. You just take the spreadsheets and you count the number of worksheets. No problem, smooth sailing. The number of cells in the worksheet, well, you have to do two joins, as you remember, spreadsheets, worksheets, cells, still okay. But then, in order to be able to calculate the feature envy that I talked about, we need to know for a given formula, how many cells is it referring to? because then we want to calculate the ratio between what part of the references are in this worksheet that the cell is in itself and what part of the references are outside of this worksheet. So a simple query, quite simple, give me for a given formula the number of connected cells. So there are two ways, as you can see here, there are two ways that cells can have references, either directly, like A7 and A9, or through a range. So we had to combine two queries. So the first part was this, a join from cells, and this is the couple table precedent. So cells, precedence, precedent cells. This is the direct combination, still okay. Then we had to go the second part through the range. So gets a bit more complicated because you have to look at what cell refers to what range and then what cells are in the range. Oh, it's still doable. And then we had to combine them. So slowly it's going towards queries that are not, not so readable anymore. I mean, I could figure this out, but if you look at this two weeks later, then maybe you're not so sure what it means anymore. And it even gets worse if, if you try to put this into SQL Server Management Studio, this happens. So sort of SQL Server Management Studio is trying to tell me you are not right using the right tool. I mean, if your tools are saying this query is so complicated, I cannot visualize it for you anymore, 
maybe you're, you're not on the right path. And this is exactly, and it was a total coincidence, when I was at a conference in Lithuania and there was someone from Neo4j giving a talk. So I thought, hey, this, this spreadsheet, that information that I'm sharing, it's actually very graphy. All the cells are connected through references to each other and they happen to be in a worksheet or on a spreadsheet, but that's not really what matters. What matters is the connection. So I started to think, maybe, you know, I, I'm just using my hammer, maybe it's not a nail, maybe I should use neo for j because it fits my domain a lot better. So this is how our data model looks like. This is a simple visualization where you have a spreadsheet, it has worksheets, and the worksheets have cells, and the cells have connections between them, and they can go through ranges, or they can have direct connections. So a cell, a formula, a location, totally decoupled from tables, at Absolutely in a graph database. And if you use Neo4j, then this query that used to be sort of horrible, it turns into this. That's wonderful, right? You just take from one cell to another cell, and you either have one hop through a range uh, directly, or you have two hops through a range. Awesome. But I, I must admit, this was not my first attempt. So it was not that, oh, I, have, I started uh, Neo4j, Cypher, I immediately knew how it went. It was more like my first attempt at this query was something like this. I was still very much thinking about joins in database. What, what tables do I need? So I need a cell that matches a range, another cell, and this cell also matches a range, and then I return all the distinct things. So, it took me a while, and maybe this is just me, but it really took me a while to get from my, to, to get rid of my SQL addiction, to get rid of thinking in terms of this is a table and I need to join it with another table. It, it took me a while. So here's another example. This is the number of cells in a spreadsheet, and my first attempt at that looked something like this. So I still thought about, okay, a cell is related to a spreadsheet. I need a worksheet in between. That's the steps I need. But then after a while, when I got more used to it, I started writing queries like this, where I thought, oh, I don't need to join in the worksheet. I don't need it. I just can think about cells are things that are two hops away from spreadsheets. And if I want all the cells, I know my data model. I know it can only go to a worksheet, so I don't need to explicitly specify. So that was a really nice journey from saving our information to SQL without really considering what was the best alternative to going to Cypher that was just a better fit. I'm not saying like Cypher is best or Neo4j is best for everything, but given our problem domain, it was a really nice fit. So that's all I wanted to, to share. I don't know if we still have time for questions, but before we go over to questions, I will just summarize my entire talk in like 30 seconds. So if you miss anything or you came in late, this is your second chance to get the gist of it. Most important, spreadsheets are code. Tell all your friends. They're not data. They are serious programming languages, Turing complete and all, and they're running the world at this point. So I built a spreadsheet analysis tool, and we used to use SQL to store all the relational information between what cells are connected to what other cells. But we use Neo4j now because we ran into larger and larger growing queries that grew too complex for even the tools to visualize, but also for us to read. And that turns a query that used to be like this into something like this, even though my first attempt wasn't as nice. So if you want to know more about my work, you can go to my website, selena.com, where we have a few of the tools released. So in addition to the smell detection tool for spreadsheets, we also have a refactoring tool and a test tool. We're basically trying to build an IDE for spreadsheets. And there's a website of my, if you thought my dissertation was funny, this is a website of my research group where I have three grad students also working on re spreadsheet research. So it's not just me anymore. We're, we're taking over the world as well. And if you want to connect, feel free to send me a tweet or send me an email if you want to know more.